welcome to Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, the podcast where nostalgia comes alive. Since July of 2021, Jake and his friends have interviewed professionals in the worlds of acting, directing, writing, puppeteering, and many more. Who will they be chatting with in this week's interview? Find out in this Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show episode. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, where nostalgia comes alive. I'm your host, Jake Duffenbaugh. With me today, as always, is our co-host, Chris Bixby and Matt Bingle. How are you guys doing? We're good. I'm here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm here. Here is doing. Yes. Yes. Here's, here's doing. Yeah. Here, yep. exactly. here, here is doing. Um, yes. First off, before we begin, I do want to say uh, thank you to DJ Bob Runkle for substituting for me on the last episode um as you folks know i was not here on the last episode due to a personal matter which is why i'm a little more formal today if you're watching the video version i wish it was for a happier occasion but um thank you to dj bob for substituting for me on the last episode greatly yes. appreciate it bob well done to you yes. um as Good for call. as for this episode our guest is a what is referred to as a vocal music director for sesame street as well as a music editor and composer He's also composed the live shows for Sesame. Uh, he's also done work for Muppets Tonight, Julie's Green Room, and Helpsters. He's also the husband of the very well-known puppeteer Leslie Carrera Rudolph. Here he is, Paul Rudolph. Paul, welcome. Happy hey, to be here. Thanks for having me. This is great. Yeah, yeah I'm, I, I started as oh, a sure. spouse on Sesame Street, but uh, then became <laughs> but eventually a, became like, then became an yeah. employee. <laughs> Yeah, that's how I, I that's how I reintroduced myself to everybody when I got there. I'm like, yes, I'm just the spouse for now, and then uh, <laughs> and, uh, it became more than that. But yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Happy to have you here. Happy to have you here. So we know who you are, but in your own words, would you care to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm. I'm. Well, you did a great job. Uh, I'm Paul Rudolph. Um, I'm a musician. I am a composer. I'm an instrument builder. Uh, my favorite instrument is behind me, the vibraphone. Uh, I'm a percussionist as well, uh, and for Sesame Street, yeah, I'm the vocal music director, music editor, and one of many composers on the show. Um, I wear wear many hats for that, uh, and I also, you know, help music direct the live shows when we have our cast involved in live performances. Uh, help music direct them. Uh, for some of the live stuff I've done for Parks, like Sesame Place, I've done the arrangements for those shows. Uh, I just uh, finished up the Halloween show which was initially postponed in May of 2020, like everything else was. Uh, yeah. But thankfully it, it came back and we were able to record that last June and the Halloween show launched at Sesame Place in Philly uh, in October or you know, late September. So um, yeah, it's been a, a, a challenge through COVID, of course, you know, piecing things together, but uh, somehow we did it, you know, as I'm sure you guys know. <laughs> right, yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So Definitely. yeah, in a nutshell, that's that's uh, that's what I do. Nice. Cool. So nice. So, what was your background like, and how did you grow up? Well, I I grew up in scenic central Illinois, uh, amongst cornfields and uh, flat terrain. Uh, but I grew up in a town in normal Illinois, central Illinois, which had two universities. And I my my exposure to the arts, I credit to my parents, of course, taking my sister and I to shows but also that town. Um, there were two universities in that town, Illinois State University and Illinois Wesleyan. And they both had their share of concerts that came through. Um, I saw everything from, you know, ACDC to one of the first concerts my parents took my sister and I to was Victor Borga. Okay. Oh, wow. you know, mm. Do you know Victor yeah. Borga? Yeah, yes, I yeah. Like I do, comedic yeah. classical musician, piano player, like ringer. I mean, like yeah. chops for days. Um, yes. And my sister and I were both taking piano lessons at the time, and my, my mom and dad both had a great sense of humor. And they're like, well, we should take them to Victor Borger, because they, they knew Victor Borger from his albums. And his albums are funny, too, because he does audio shtick, and he never really finishes a song, like when he's playing something classical. And he does this whole bit using verbal punctuation, like punctuation noises, like when he does an exclamation point. Zoop! So I had heard his records from my parents playing them at home. And... You know, and as my as my sister and I were taking piano lessons, it was very serious. Um, in fact, I, no shame in this. The first piano teacher my sister and I both had made us cry. Like honestly, like I'm surprised I'm even in music today, <laughs> based on that early fir first experience. Um, although my dad was a drummer, so that was very uh, very different because he taught me things and it was always fun. But anyway, so my sister and I are, are studying piano. It was very serious, 
And I was always looking off the page of the black and white notes and thinking funny stuff. I don't know why, um, but I, you know, I would play something too fast or too slow or make mistakes on purpose, whatever. And my sister and I played duets and we'd always want to go faster. So then when we saw Victor Borga, I was like, okay, wait a minute. He's taking classical music, a serious thing of me practicing Bach inventions all day and he's making it funny. So that kind of opened my eyes. And honestly, I think you could kind of connect the dots to the Muppets and music and humor um, and my appreciation for that, I guess. So Normal was a great exposure to that. We, you know, we would see um, musicals as they came through town. We saw Sound of Music when we were kids. Uh, we'd see orchestras come through, jazz bands come through, and of course, rock and roll. And my first concert I ever saw live was at the Illinois State Horton Fieldhouse. I saw ACDC and I saw Kansas and, you know, um, saw the police, saw Peter Gabriel. Uh, so, you know, as far as my exposure to music, it was great. And the nice thing about being right in the central part of Illinois was bands would come through going from Chicago to St. Louis and they would stop by, you know, central Illinois, whether it was Champaign, Illinois, which is where I ended up going to university or Bloomington Normal or Peoria. They were, they were always coming through central Illinois. Um, so that was my upbringing. Um, I, I kind of I knew I wanted to major in music at, at some point. Um, I was super active in the, the concert band, symphonic band at, um, at my high school, and I wrote some percussion cadences with a good friend of mine, Bill Brott. We were kind of the um, co-section leaders of the drum line. And I also knew the Illinois State University had a very good marching band, very good drum line. But I was so drumline focused and I was also, I want to get out of town focused that I went to school 50 miles away in uh, Champaign, Illinois, went to the University of Illinois, majored in music education. So that was my start is like, I'm going to just get a music degree. And I didn't have any specific goals of like being a band director for the rest of my life or composing music. I just knew I loved music. Um, I had composed a few things that, you know, I wouldn't even know where to find today may, might still be in my parents' attic or in a, in a box somewhere. But, and some of those were funny, stupid, silly things that I tried to put together, but never had any audio for it. Um, so then University of Illinois was music education. That was a pretty straightforward um, education to go into teaching. Um, and I was, you know, everybody that went through the music education program there was certified K through 12 music. Um, I actually took a, there, there are a couple tests you take to get certified in different states. So I was also certified out of state. I thought about moving to California because there was a Long Beach, California job. Uh, I might've met Leslie earlier than I did in 1995, <laughs> but I didn't. So anyway, um, after I graduated, I was, a, I was a band director for three years and I kind of just, I was doing a lot of arranging and composing for that high school and I, I kind of looked down the road and thought, I don't think I'm going to be a band director for 35 years. So I went back to school. I worked on my, my master's in composition and arranging. And that kind of led me down the path I'm on now, which is more of the composing and arranging world. Um, and music direction, I think, comes directly from my, my university, of experience, university experience, whether it was with instrumental or we had choral. Uh, we had to basically learn to teach anything from strings to brass to winds to, uh, to choral music. And so I had a real well-rounded undergrad experience. And then my graduate experience was much more focused on composition. So, and then when I finished grad school, a very good friend of mine who was, I went to undergrad with was, had actually moved to Los Angeles and um, she worked for a film composing agent so uh, maybe he had 10 or 12 composers, you know, under his wing. And she, she convinced me to move out there and kind of get involved in music some way. She's like, just get out here. You got to get out here. And I was kind of, you know, sorry, my mic is maybe making a little noise. Um, I was really kind of nine to five set in my parents' ways and kind of finding that job that's going to be secure. So it was a little, it was a leap of faith for me to go out there. And uh, my friend, um, convinced me to do that. She, she knew my talent and she knew my background. And so when I got to LA, I started working with Richard Gibbs, who was a composer under this uh, specific film scoring agent um, that my friend worked for. And so I started with him on the Tracy Ullman show, which he was finishing up when I got to work with him. Uh, we did a 
kind of a Hallmark movie thing. And then he got the call to be the music director for uh, Muppets Tonight, which was the resurgence of the Muppet Show, if you will, the second live TV Muppet Show. Um, and so I was just more than happy to join him on that ride. And that's, here we are, <laughs> 25 years later. And uh, I, I wound my way to Sesame Street. Um, in between Muppets Tonight and Sesame Street, I act actually worked for two composers in LA for 10 years. Um, and I really learned the digital audio world through them. Uh, Trivers Myers music, John Trivers and Liz Myers. Um, they both actually started in New York um, in the Grease Pit. They were in, um, in the Broadway musical Grease. They were both in the, the orchestra pit for that, but then oh, went nice. on to compose commercials. And John actually co-wrote some songs with Blue Oyster Cult, played bass with them for a bit. Um, and they were just, they were really great to kind of be a fly on the wall and listen to them arrange and compose for commercials because they had a client who had an assignment for them and they would find a way to make that even more creative. Um, Liz had a classical background. John had kind of a rock and folk background. So okay. they were very good working together. And then when, it, when they needed to, they would hire, say, a jazz arranger like John Beasley, who just uh, won, I think, his second or third Grammy. Um, they would wow. bring in a, a ringer for that. So working for them for 10 years really taught me a lot about working in the studios, um, arranging, um, composing as well, but a lot of the kind of the nuts and bolts um, that go into commercial music. So that was a, that was a great experience. And they it allowed me to learn digital audio as I was working for them because Pro Tools was very new at the time. Um, in, in fact, bitter, bitter older engineers called it Pro Fools at the time. Uh, but now it's it's my daily workhorse. You're you're listening right now through Pro Tools. So um, that's how we do all my music editing. And that's, that was a big background help for me to learn the digital world. So nice. I think that's how I got to Sesame Street. I don't know, is that, <laughs> <laughs> is that a, a curvy enough winding road? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, no worries, no worries. So can you talk about how you were first in inspired to get into the music, to the music business? Well, I mean, if you go way back, it's it's high school. It's um, the the band directors I had in high school were very good about, uh, and our orchestra teacher as well, uh, were great about exposing us to different styles of music. Um, and I think my parents were too, in some respect. Um, that that kind of that just piqued my interest in in writing and arranging. I think um, the earliest stuff for me it was always percussion driven because it was always either a cadence that we were writing for my marching band in high school. Um, it was some stuff that I wrote in college. Like I wrote a couple, uh, I, wrote, I wrote a bunch of pieces during my, my grad school days, but also undergrad days as well. Um, just percussion driven things. Um, when, I, when, I did, when I was a band director, I would do uh, marching band arrangements. That was central Illinois and the Midwest is full of marching bands as you probably know. Um, and I marched in the Cavaliers Drum and Bugle Corps as well. And so I had this focus of, of marching band, um, but in the, in the percussion world. And I really, that, that I think was my most focus um, style, is, if you will, is, um, is just really percussion driven. So I love percussion ensembles. Um, I love the variety in you know, percussion music and of course found object instruments and all that, which is my, my side uh, art job uh, with Glank, my percussion group Glank. That's all, you know, a bunch of found object instruments, a bunch of anonymous performers. I, I consider that a, a, an elaborate Halloween costume when we perform. Um, yeah, I think, yeah. Does that answer your question, Jake? I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> more or <laughs> yeah. less. Yeah. I mean, again, the comedy was always there. And I think, right. I think it's always been fun for me to do arrangements. And, and Muppets Tonight was an eye opener for that because I had seen The Muppet Show and one of my favorite episodes, of course, was, was Buddy Rich battle, battling Animal. Yes. Mm -hmm. Drum battle. I mean, that, I, I knew Buddy Rich from the records my dad had uh, played and I was just like, what? This is great. This is humor. This is puppets and Muppets. And um, so watching that all come to life, literally working on Muppets Tonight was just mind blowing. So, wow. Yeah. And yeah, on the subject of uh, Muppets Tonight, do you have any fun stories you can share from your Muppets Tonight days? Oh, man. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, well, yeah, there's a bunch. Um, 
there's two the two two that come to mind. One is Whoopi Goldberg, uh, when mm, she was oh on. Yes. If you've seen that that show, uh, I mean, she's just a dynamic performer. I mean, people see her now uh, mostly on on the View on the on talk shows things, but but a comedian and consummate performer. Um, so for that, um, living in LA, I had a, a broken down used old Honda Civic, and I was tasked with taking a piano and an amp to the Beverly Hills Hotel and meeting with Whoopi Goldberg to set the keys for her songs, because she was singing on like five different songs, four or five songs. And so it was always important to get the, get the ranges right. And that's something I do every day with our Sesame Street cast is finding the right range for their character. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of a guest star, though, you want the guest star to be comfortable and confident with their key. So, right. and this is before the digital days of, oh, I'll just go there with a, an iPad, which I do all the time now um, with my cast and just plunk out notes on an iPad. This was like, I needed a, I, the only keyboard we had at Muppets was this full size, super heavy keyboard and a super heavy keyboard amp and a, a little hand truck. But, but if you know the Beverly Hills Hotel, it's super fancy. And she was staying there because she was writing the script for the Oscars that year. So this would have been 96. And so she was staying at a little villa with Bruce, Bruce Valanche, who wrote a bunch of you know, Oscars scripts and jokes and things. And she, she had no time to come to the studio and meet with us. So I was tasked to meet with her. So the best part for me was rolling up in my beat up Honda Civic and telling the, <laughs> the valet guys, I'm like, yeah, I'm meeting with Whoopi Goldberg in a cabana. Can you help me haul my keyboard? <laughs> So um, they're, like, <laughs> they're looking at my car going, OK, um, security, you know, uh, but it was fine. I, you know, I, I rolled everything up. She was super sweet. Uh, Bruce Valanche was there. I mean, they're literally in the middle of writing the script and I set up my keyboard and, and she was great. Um, and, and I think the second one is Prince. Um, oh, yes. Everybody yes. that worked on that day was just blown away by that day and, and actually a couple days because we met with him uh, beforehand for a read through. Um, we met with his engineer who he brought in from Minneapolis specifically to kind of update some of the songs, um, update percussion tracks and, and do some different edits for the songs that we ended up doing. Um, so the read through was bizarre too, because of all things, there was a power outage right in Hollywood and where we would normally do read throughs, there was, the power was out. So we had to go to a different studio and do a read through. And it was literally, it was Conway studios and it was around a pool table. So I'll never forget, like, I'm sitting there just taking note, taking music notes, and there's Prince and Brian Henson and, and Jerry Nelson and Dave Goals and Bill Beretta, Steve Whitmire, and they're all sitting around a pool table doing this read-through with Prince. And, you know, in hindsight, just, I, I was, my head was exploding. Um, <laughs> and the funny part about it, too, was he, we were going to do a, a sketch called Muppet Hoo-Ha or Muppet Hee-Haw. It was like a parody of the show Hee-Haw. And... You know, nobody, everybody had this odd kind of vision of him, which was kind of presented to us by his people, which was, you know, he's super shy. Um, uh, you know, he'll, he's more than game to do the Muppet stuff, but we didn't know how far we could go with shtick and comedy and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Even the Muppet mm -hmm. hoo-ha sketch was like, you know, he's going to be in overalls. He's going to have a cowboy hat on. He's going to have a little straw. And he was, way, he was chuckling the whole time reading this. So, and I'm kind of looking at Brian Henson and, Dick Blasucci, like the head producer, I'm like, oh, we're good, right? So, um, and he had re-recorded vocals for, um, you know, 1999, and um, she gave her angels and stuff. So the, the songs that he did on the show, he had re-recorded vocals and, of course, lip sync for that. Our Muppet vocals had to add to that, which was just amazing because we heard these tracks that were updated. They were different than when he recorded them in the 80s, and um, his engineer was was super helpful with that. So, and then the day of mm -hmm. taping, it was like a 20 hour day. I mean, I, I can't even remember. <laughs> All I remember is we had a, we had a grand piano on, on stage for him to play, obviously, and, and kind of, it was more or less for filming. It was not necessarily for playing. And so when you rent a piano on stage, there's so much noise on stage that you often rent it with a damper that dampens all of the strings, just in case the pedal goes down and you hear literally like piano reverb in the room, you don't want that you don't want to blow a take because you're hearing reverberation off the piano for some reason. So we, we, we rented the piano just for a prop, right? And then at about midnight, he wanted to play the piano. And so the stage manager came up to me and said, hey, Prince really wants to play the piano. And I'm like, 
we have to somehow take that damper off. So I, I had no idea how to do this. I brought, I, I called the rental house at midnight, got the guy out of bed, and he's kind of explaining it like there's a couple wing nuts and there's this bar that goes across the knees and there's felt on it and all this stuff. I'm like, I'm, I'm just terrified because I'm like, I have to get this piano ready for Prince to play. So again, so I get a carpenter and we walk up to the set and Prince is just still sitting there. He's, he's kind of just noodling around on the, on the piano, but of course it's not making any noise. It's making a very wooden noise. And, um, you know, I just said, excuse us, we're going to, you know, adjust the piano so you can play. He's like, oh, thanks. And he walked off the set. And we gently, you know, it's an eighty thousand dollar piano, or whatever. I don't, I don't want to drop a wing nut inside the piano, and so we're gently taking the stamper off, and we move it. And he comes back in five or six minutes and starts playing. And then, you know, it's twelve thirty or one o'clock in the morning, whatever. And you hear Prince playing a piano live on set, and the whole crew is just like you can hear a pin drop, just him kind of noodling around, not not playing what we were going to tape, or you know, not not practicing the part that he's going to lip sync. He's just playing. So that was a moment. Oh, those are my two. Fa- those are two of my favorites. Yeah, Tony Bennett is another one. I mean, there's just so many. It's just it's astounding. That's and that, awesome. that show, it's where I met my bride. You know, it was uh, there was a moment too where in, in the Prince show where they were doing the song uh, she gave her angels and they had those underwater puppets. Mm. I don't know if you've seen that, but there's all this silk kind of flowing. It was literally like mm-hmm. looking through a giant aquarium as they filmed that. And, and Leslie and I were just sitting off to the side, just kind of mesmerized, just watching this underwater puppetry happen. It's just great. Oh, so. that's, awesome. uh, it's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yes. That's fantastic. Amazing. Pr- Prince is up there. Is, actually, probably is my favorite episode of Muppets Tonight. Oh, cool. yes. Such a yeah. such yeah. A amazing yes. episode. Yeah, yes. and, and a lot of like, I mean, as far as the humor goes and the music goes, it's it's probably one of my favorites for that reason too because there's such variety in the music um, yeah and i think variety in the humor too you know absolutely in, in oh, yeah Definitely. yeah and, and and funny enough you know we actually did previously got someone who, who worked on muppets tonight which is brad abro oh yeah okay brad yeah. Abro, yeah. i remember yes. brad yeah yeah he's he's, he's, he's awesome to work with. yeah yes yes so so if sesame street are there any favorite muppets or human cast members you you've worked with Oh, that that list is longer than Muppets Tonight because it's been 15 years now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's yeah. so many. There's so many. I mean, it, the first season I was on, we had Jason Mraz on. Uh, oh we, yes, we did yes. a parody of of his song and we called it Outdoors instead of I'm Yours, and um, I'm pretty sure that Joey Mazzarino wrote altered the lyrics for that, right? Because Joey mm, was a yes. master at that. Joey oh, could yeah. take take those songs, any any given song, and and rework the lyrics to fit our style but fit our curriculum or the message or whatever the song would be and that mm-hmm. that's one of my favorites it's also watching jason Mraz work through the song just by himself with the acoustic guitar before he sang it uh was great because you know he's probably sung sung that song hundreds of times if not thousands of times and the lyrics are slightly different and there's a slightly different rhyme scheme to them so watching him you know work through that was really great and i i just I appreciate him as a musician because he he's not um he didn't come up through uh let's say the celebrity shows <laughs> if you will uh mm-hmm. he he honed his skills in coffee houses you know for nine years before he was officially signed i think it's about nine years he met his percussionist friend there who's on i'm yours and does all the harmonies and that and i actually kind of arranged that harmony for elmo for kevin clash to do on the day when we uh, oh. worked through that song uh, oh, wow. to kind of, I was matching Jason Mraz's percussionist harmonies, but of course it had to be up the octave, it had to be up high. So mm. I had to kind of flip the harmonies to, to work for, uh, for Jason Mraz's lead vocal. Um, but just watching somebody like that, a musician like that, that is so comfortable standing and playing and singing. And I say playing like he's playing. He, and his, his groove on his guitar is great. Everything is just so natural. It's like he's probably more natural doing that than he is just walking. You know what I mean? People mm-hmm. always said that about Joni, Joni Mitchell. Like she's more, she's much more comfortable sitting there playing and singing than she would be just walking, you know, and chewing gum or something that takes different coordination, right? Um, and he was great on set too. It's also fun to watch um, celebrities interact with the Muppets because they, some think, well, this show's for kids. So how do I act? Do I act like a kid? Do I act 
am I delivering this message kind of in a, hey kids? And it's not that, you know, they, they just need to be right. themselves. And that's what, that's what the, our, our head producers back then, that's one thing I really gleaned from, uh, from Kevin Clash and, and Carolyn Parente early on was let them be themselves because they're going to be more natural and more comfortable doing that anyway. And, yeah. you know, we've had celebrities look at the puppets and see the puppeteer down there and go, wait, so who do I look at? You know, because it, it, it can be confusing when if you're not if you're not a if you're not an actor if you're not you know if you're if you're an athlete or you know somebody who's not used to a camera, they might not know those things. Um, or looking at a teleprompter for for lyrics to lip sync in a song and or even just speaking words as part of the script. You know, the, you got to make them comfortable. And our cast is so good at that. They're they're so good at once they once the the Muppets are on then they become more relaxed relaxed i think and they be, they all become the celebs become kids again right away um oh, so mm -hmm. early on jason mraz yes uh, elvis costello was another one early on i think that was season mm -hmm. 41 when he did um a monster went and ate my red two which is the parody of an angel wore my red shoes and it's another one that i was like how is this going to work and i'm looking at the lyrics and i'm listening to the original and I know that was Joey because I talked to Joey Mazzarino about that song and wow. that he just did a great job of taking that song, the original from, I think, 1980 and, and making that work for us and monsters and eating a two. The Cookie Monster was eating the, the number two, which is another one of my favorites. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, it, and Elvis Costello came back for our 50th special, too, which was amazing. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. That's that was a very real. special day. That was a very surprise day for everybody because no one really knew that Kermit was going to be there. So, yeah, that was, yeah. Awesome. Oh, my that was gosh. A, that was a moment. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah I know so, somebody, somebody brought that up before. I don't remember who, though, but somebody brought up Kermit for the 50th yeah. on our show before. I think it was I Ryan. Remember who. Might have been Ryan. Was it Ryan? I think yeah. I think yeah. so. It might have been Ryan. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think it might have been Ryan. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and yeah, talk about, you're right. we'll talk about like hearing a pin drop because what what we did on the day was we had a we had a keyboard player there, our sesame keyboard player, John Daly was there. He was off to the side. And Elvis Costello was gonna play a little bit on guitar, but really minimally, and he had he had in ears in. And so did Matt Vogel, right? So all they could mm -hmm. hear was the piano. Um, I don't even think we had a click track going. I think it was pretty loose. I mean, as, as far as like starting the song, we didn't like say four clicks and you start. Um, so in terms of the sound on the set, nobody could hear the piano except me, Elvis Costello and Matt. Wow. Uh, I think the director had in ears, had in -ears too. Um, so they could hear the piano just so they could feel the, the pulse and kind of get the, the vibe of the song. Right. We, shot it in, we shot it in two parts. I think it was the front half and then the back half is where Kermit's sitting on the steps of one, two, three. And so yeah. I was just, I mean, I always have the best seat in the house because I'm always sitting basically at, at puppeteer level so I can conduct or cue people. And so I'm literally, I'm on the floor just watching Matt, you know, roll towards me with Kermit and, and Elvis Costello. And I'm just like, where am I right now? <laughs> <laughs> it was just, yeah. That was one of those days. You know, oh, man. super special. Oh, my That's awesome. So, yes. That's awesome. Memoirs. Those are, I always say, those are my memoir, memoir worthy days. Uh -huh. you know? So uh -huh. stay tuned for the memoirs. That's awesome. <laughs> 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 forward to it. So you kind of talked about it, but as a uh, vocal music director, can you like tell our audience what exactly a vocal music director is and some of the jobs that you do in terms sure. of that? Yeah. So the, the the page to stage as we say starts with the curriculum and the writers and and the composers that basically are tasked to uh write a demo for each song and i'm, I'm one of those composers as you know so we mm -hmm. i as the music vocal music director i will get the demo the earliest version of that song that's been approved by everybody upstream from me so the script is written the lyrics are written the demo is written and then it, once it's approved it gets to me so at that point I have to, I talked about this earlier, finding the range for the song. So mm. if it's, let's say it's Abby, Elmo and Rudy. Well, I've got, I've got a specific range there, right? Abby and Elmo are soprano altos. Rudy mm -hmm. can kind of go between tenor and baritone. So I'll listen to the song, the demo itself, and I'll, I'll judge that based on our character ranges. So I'll look at the high notes. I'll look at the low notes. Cause as you can imagine with any voice, any character voice, your your singing range might be here 
but the character range might be here. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it, it's, it's very different. Like, especially with, with, uh, with Ryan as Elmo, it's obviously a falsetto. So if he goes too low, mm -hmm. it'll get out of character in that falsetto voice. Mm -hmm. um, and, and anybody that goes too high, any character up too high can get very strained sounding. So you might lose character up there. So it's always, I'm always double checking the range for character because that's super, super important. Sometimes I have to do what I call a diplomatic key, which is kind of finding a decent range for everybody. And for instance, like the Macy's Parade song, when I do the, I do the full vocal arrangement for that, there's you know, 16 or 18 voices in that, ranging from Telly Monster to Prairie Dawn. You know, yeah. which is my favorite thing yeah. to arrange every year because I have this palette, this amazing palette to work with of these character sounds. And yet within that palette, I want I want each character to speak. I want to be able to hear, you know, I want to be able to hear Bert versus Grover, right? Because mm -hmm. it's the same performer, it's Eric Jacobson, very different character sound between the two. But ge generically speaking, there's some similarities in terms of brightness and such. So mm -hmm. I'm always really specific about that, like finding like where should I put Bert in relation to Grover or Ernie, um, because we have a lot of tenors, <laughs> we have a lot of tenors in the show, um, and balancing that out with the soprano and altos for the Macy's Parade song is is a, is a, always a fun challenge. So that's my first task is saying, okay, where does this song sit the best for each character, or if it's a solo character, obviously just giving it, you know, to that, mm. that one character. So. After that, um, if, I, if the key changes, I'll go back to, um, we'll, we'll basically tell the composer needs to come down a whole step, needs to come up a whole step, and they'll basically redo the track, which is a demo track, like the band track that they're creating is not the final. Um, our final band track is arranged by Joe Feidler, our amazing uh, arranger, um, and our head music director, Bill Sherman, like they take, take mm -hmm. care of all that after the fact. Yeah. Sometime when I started uh, with when I was first on uh, with Mike Renzi, we they tried to do it the other way around. They tried to get the band stuff finished first so that the performers could record to that sound. Um, but partly because our, our schedule is so compressed and, you know, there's always last minute changes coming in. Even the day I record vocals, there might be a lyric change or something in the band might change. So it's, it's harder to get that finished product ahead of the vocals um, recording. So that's done in post. Um, so then, uh, once the key is set, the demo is recorded or, or you know adjusted for for key. Then I send that to the performers, and I give them at least three or four days to kind of listen to that. Uh, send them a lead sheet as well, um, lyric sheet from the script, obviously, and give them time to prep that. And then, depending on the project, whether it's something for YouTube or something for our street stories. Uh, we'll record them, you know, a couple days before we tape it. And as far as what happens when I'm vocal directing them, I record each voice individually at a small little stand-up vocal booth at Kaufman Astoria Studios. And I'm basically cueing them with my left hand and I'm running Pro Tools with my right hand. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm the engineer as well. I'm, I'm basically, it's a very simple setup. When I say I'm an engineer, I'm a vocal recordist is what I'm doing. So I have a very, very simple setup just the way I like it. Uh, with Pro Tools and a really good microphone and a good preamp and all that. And it's basically, what's fun about that for me is it's, it's I think, less pressure for everybody, the vocalist, the, the singer and me included, to not have to go to an outside studio and record because then you're on the clock and, oh, we got 20 minutes to record this or whatever. Um, a, you know, a song can take ten, 10 minutes or an hour. Just, it all varies. It varies about the length, the, it varies for the rhythms, the pitches, all that stuff. Um, so I'm in my office, I'm queuing, I'm recording, we'll get multiple takes of every uh, song and phrase. And that's kind of where the music, vocal music direction kind of ends. That's where I start doing my music editing, which is basically tweaking the song, tweaking pitch and rhythm, making sure everybody's, wow. you know, lining up together. What I do with that is then I organize that Pro Tools session and I deliver that to our A2, who does playback on set, which is Chris Cezano, who's like, he and I, he and I speak Pro Tools. Um, <laughs> we are simpatico when it comes to digital audio. He's a, he's a digital audio wizard. He's my digital audio guy for Glank from our percussion group too. Oh, nice. he's, just, he's a wizard that way. So, but he and I have a, a nice. great method now after it's probably been 10, 12 years um, of me delivering a Pro Tools session to, to him. And he knows exactly the stops and starts. 
if we are uh, on set and I need pre-roll at a certain point, I can talk to him on my comm radio and just say, hey, pre-roll line 10. Boom, we're ready to go. So then I'm back on set. I'm back on stage for this. So my, my vocal music directing has come back to the set. And as I was saying before, I have the best seat in the house because I, I get to sit right at puppeteer level and cue people. Mm-hmm. If it's a very complex song, I'm cueing people. If it's a, if it's a guest celebrity, I'm, I'm essentially helping them, watching them for lip sync. If there's a teleprompter and they're watching lip sync for that, um, I'm making sure that's clear. Um, for the, if we're doing something live, which is rare, um, I'll, I'll have my iPad keyboard and I'll give them a pitch and we'll do things live. That's usually something super simple, like happy birthday or head, shoulders, knees and toes or something. Yeah. Uh, not something crazy complex. So, so that's, yeah. that's my, the, when I was originally hired, I was, my, I think my title was uh, stage music director, like on set. So that anything that happened around the set was my, my purview. But yeah. in this case, yeah, it's mostly me um, cueing people. Um, yeah. And then <laughs> after that, once we're all done, it goes to post production. And the only thing mm-hmm. I have left to do there is like, if we have any looping or ADR or any fixes to do something they have right. changed on the day, we, we often do music editing on the day. We might take out four bars or we might add four bars. Or if, if Abby has a, a magic effect, Oh, you know, we need a little more space there for that. Can we just add a bar? So digitally it's so easy to do that because you've got that, the technology to do it there right on the spot. And the directors love that because it gives them that freedom. Like if they need more time or less time or the producers who are looking at the clock going, the script is a little long. Can we cut, you know, eight bars out of the song? I'll literally go to Chris Susano in the booth and say, okay, we're going to, we're going to cut this half of this and four bars here, four bars there and make it shorter. Mm-hmm. Um, we always like it longer because the, the, you know, having, having full length songs is always preferred over a, a little 20 second song. Um, right. Yeah. Um, it is what it is. You know, you do have to fit yeah. the time frame. Um, yeah. what, I, what I love about this recent stuff we've done are we've done these little mini musicals. Um, I don't know if you saw the one about the turtles and the webby flippy feet with Alan and Nina. Um, but it's basically a mini musical about, well, it's a, a turtle is the main character. I think it was David. who was a, a, one of the main characters on that David Rudman. Um, but it, there's like four or five songs within our seven minute, you know, street story. And it's really fun to do those because it's it's like a mini Muppet show for us because it, it feels mm-hmm. like, well, if if this were a half hour, if this were Whoopi Goldberg, there'd be four songs full length. Mm-hmm. And in this case, yeah. it's compressed to seven minutes, but there's still three or four songs in there and they're really fun to do those. Uh, awesome. So that's awesome. That's why I feel that's why I feel like we're we're nodding back to Jim Henson and the Muppet show is when that yes. comedy can come back in. And and of course, I mean I didn't, I should have led with this, but I am so honored to be in the seat I'm in after we just wrapped season 54. I mean, to, 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 to follow the path from Joe Raposo and all the legends that came before me, all the lyricists, all the composers, all the musicians, it's just, I pinch myself all the time when I'm, when I'm on set and that Kermit, that Kermit Elvis Costello thing was happening. I'm like, again, where am I? But nod to the history of the show you know, not just Jim Henson, but, but any, any Muppet performer that's been doing this for, for so long, um, you know, uh, uh, you probably know that Jerry Nelson was on Muppets Tonight, of course, but he was, oh, a, yeah. he was a big mm-hmm. mentor to Leslie. His dressing room was right next to Leslie's and, and oh. was a huge, uh, huge and important mentor to her back in the day. I'll let her tell you those stories though, because there's some great stories. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's an honor. Uh, that oh, where, where do we start wonderful. with that question? I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I say question. Yeah. Welcome music yeah. direction. Yeah. It. Um, yes. So now, can you talk a little bit about your uh, composing work for South Street? Because I know you've also composed as well. Yeah. So the the cool thing about our the group of composers that write for the show is we all have our little niche, uh, and mine, of course, is kind of fun, bombastic percussion kind of stuff. Mm. Um, I mean, we've got like. Eli Bowling is our, he's our Broadway guy. Like that guy can, mm-hmm. he can write a Sondheim melody in his sleep and the chord changes and everything. If they tasked me with that, I'd be like, okay, let me consult some reference books about <laughs> Sondheim. I mean, I might be able to come up with a melody or something, but I mean, he's a ringer for that. So, and then, you know, we have our, our wonderful pop duo, which is uh, JP and Kat, JP and Catherine. Ah, yes. Are amazing. And they, they've written a couple mm. of those little mini musicals for us. 
uh, uh, but they just, yes. they live and breathe pop, and Catherine's a great singer, and I'll listen to her demos and be like, wow, she makes this sound so easy. And then when it gets to the character voices, they're like, wow, this is pretty complex. But yeah, we've all got our little niche. So, um, so an example for me is because I love found object instruments, which I'll show you in a bit, uh, we did a show maybe five, six years ago called Bike Shop with a Beat. And it was when Nina was at the bike shop and somehow the instruments became the parts that were bicycle parts. And so oh, there was mm -hmm. ways that we showed that with like a water bottle, putting nuts and bolts in a metal water bottle. You can make a shaker out of it. Um, Telly was hitting the fenders and they all had kind of different pitches. Um, Abby was just, she was tapping the bicycle seat and then ringing the bell. Uh, Nina had, you know, playing cards, putting them in the spokes, that old trick. Um, so that was really fun for me. So I was able to write percussively uh, and also put in melody for singing in that to, to basically, you know, compose the, the lesson for that, which was really fun. Um, I did another one for, um, well, one, one we had a, I, I'm a big fan of taiko and um, Japanese and, and, and Chinese drumming, taiko, taiko drumming. And so we had a special a while back that we did for that um, where I was able to write, again, writing very rhythmically, I think you'd say. Um, most recently, oh, I can't tell you this one because it's season 54. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's very rhythmic. Uh, what can I say about it? It's, about it's like where, I, it's like where I, I wanted to say it, but I can't do it right yeah, now. Just, right, uh, yeah, right. You'll have to wait for that yeah. one. I don't know yeah. when that, that episode will, will premiere, but... Um, but that's kind of, I, I always start percussively because I, I, I look at the lyrics and I find the rhyme scheme of the lyrics, which every, every composer does. You, you look at a, basically the, the lyrics, the way the, the writer has written the lyrics. And that's one thing that everybody should know is that our, our wonderful Sesame Street writers write the lyrics and mm -hmm. we as composers come in and write the music for that. Um, it's somewhat rare. Sometimes we'll have a composer write music and lyrics, but uh, more, than, more often than not, it's the, the writers writing those. So and in certain cases, you know, every composer does this too. They might just tweak a line or a word or a phrase or take out a the or an uh, um, because oftentimes we've already, before the song starts, we've already discussed the lesson or the curriculum or whatever the, the message is. And so we feel like sometimes we can alter the song a little bit to kind of take out those less singy words mm -hmm. um, and make it flow a little better, um, which happens quite a bit, actually. Um, I'll get little changes from the composer from the, the script to the demo. So does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, guess. yeah, absolutely. I think so, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. It does. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. So of course, through Sesame and really starting off with Muppets Tonight, you've also worked a lot with your wife, Leslie Carrara Rudolph. What's it like getting to work so closely with her? Well, I mean, A, she's brilliant. Uh, and I'm, I, I mean, sure, I'm biased, uh, <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> but you, you probably know her not only as Abby, of course, but as Lolly, right. Lolly Lardbop. Oh, yeah. yes. And the, mm -hmm. the many, the many characters that she does that are outside of Sesame Street, of course, that are her characters, Granny Dot and, and Mrs. Gilg and all this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. No, it's, it's amazing. I mean, when we're working together, when I'm working with her on an Abby song, you know, or an Abby vocal for a Sesame song, um, I try and treat her the same way I would treat any other vocalist in the booth. Um, pitch, rhythm, character, everything good. Uh. Um, so it's, but it's fun because, you know, oh, yes. yeah, there's a, there's an extra layer there, of course, because I'm married to her, but we, uh, we always have fun in the, in the vocal booth. Whenever it's, it's a silly song that Abby's singing or a serious song or whatever, we're, we're always having fun doing that. Um, I think with she and, and all the other cast members, the funnest thing for us to do are what we call anything Muppets, AMs, mm -hmm. because it's a new voice. It's a turtle, it's a bird, it's a rabbit, uh -huh. whatever it is. It's something that they, they come up with that voice on the day. Like they might see the puppet and understand, okay, it's an older uh, teacher, female. Okay, let me think about that voice. But they always wanna see the puppet before they start singing because that informs a lot about the character. So right. Leslie and I, I think some of our most gut laughing, crying moments have been anything Muppets where she's coming up with a voice. And I'm like, one voice she did was like, that's weird, like something up here. And it was like, 
Kermit, but it was like Bert, but it was like Bert's sister, you know, not Bertina. That's, that's, <laughs> it was something in between all that. I'm like, where what? is that? I had never heard that voice before from her. So, and that goes for, for many of our cast, you know, when they, when they come up with these AM voices, I'm like, I have never heard that voice from you. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so Leslie and I, as far as Sesame goes, you know, work is work. We're we're doing our thing. Um, yeah. It's it's fun to watch her work through a, one of her cabaret shows, um, because I I've seen her do hundreds of these cabarets and many different arcs. I don't know if you've seen her cabaret shows, but you know, there's stories, there's songs, there's acting, there's there's a message, um, and she's got one coming up on June seventeenth. Um, I'm not sure where it is but it's in June, June 17th. Uh, <laughs> stay tuned. Um, but she working, working through those is great because musically she's coming at it from many different angles, including her own voice, just as yeah. Leslie singing, um, which I remember her dad always used to say, why can't you sing in your voice? You know, you got a beautiful voice. Why do you sing in all these character voices? <laughs> um, so, but watching her work, like write the story, and work through the songs of a cabaret. And then I, I accompany her on just on percussion for those quite often. Um, she has a keyboard player that will, will accompany her, of course. Uh, but watching those, and I'm telling you, there's, there's certain Lolly songs that I've heard 50 or 60 times, like Believe is this wonderful ballad that her friend, uh, her friend from California wrote. Um, it gets me every time. And I'm always kind of tearing up listening and watching the song because I know her background I know her stories probably better than most people in the room do. And yet I still see and hear this song. And I'm like, ah, oh, it's a beautiful song. So, um, oh. and it, 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 many of her shows and her cabarets will culminate with this relationship between she and Lolly or something that Lolly has gone through. Um, and yeah. that's why it's, it's fun watching her with Lolly too, because Lolly can speak at a kid's level or an adult level. And so when she's doing an adult cabaret, she doesn't go blue. She doesn't swear just to swear, you know, uh, she never swears actually. And even in her adult cabarets, but there's always double entendres. There's always silly stuff that, you know, you, you as an audience member looking at Lolly kind of winking <laughs> as Leslie's winking, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, there's certain adult jokes that you get right away in the room and you're like, Oh, Lolly doesn't understand that. You know what I mean? So it's, I don't know. That's mm -hmm. a, that's a tangent. Um, but as far as she, yeah, she and I working together, it's it's just a blast, and and she's super helpful, uh, and, and inspired by me too, as far as what I do with my percussion uh, stuff, and um, is super super helpful there, organ helping me kind of organize shows when I think about a show and the ups and downs and the energy of a show of a Glank show. Um, I'm always running that by her, and uh, of course my percussionist friends as well. So. <laughs> Awesome. A day in the life, nice. you know. Definitely. Day in the life. Definitely. So yes. now she's 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 wonderful. Yeah. yeah thanks. So now yeah, with course. with with Sesame Street because it's such a diverse and inclusive show. How 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 important do you think it is that we have such a diverse and inclusive show on TV such as Sesame Street? Well, yeah, I think I, I think one of our producers said it best. It's always um, the show is always morphing based on societal norms and societal changes. Um, it's, it's a mirror to society kind of, um, but I think I, it's so important because it, it's, it's a respected name for one thing. I think if you just started a puppet show today, um, you, would you would of course have diversity in things, um, but yeah, it's important for the message and the curriculum behind it. What I always appreciate is when that's applied to music. Um, and when you can take the message of a of curriculum, be it about a social norm or about inclusion, um, and and hire a composer that can just do that justice, that's super important to the show. Um, that's not taking away from any of our arrangers, composers that um, are not necessarily diverse, but it's just they add a stamp to it. Um, I think you know part of what I love about the show, of course, is the humor. So. Um, it, there's that, it's that fine line of like balancing curriculum, teaching, um, a message, which could be a social message and humor and music. Um, and I don't know if you've seen the, the documentary, um, it's the first 20 years of Sesame Street, I think the one that came out last spring, was it sunny days, how I got to Sesame Street. Um, there's a moment in that where Jim Henson 
asks John Stone, because he, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's reading the script, he's figuring everything out, but he goes, wait, wait, sorry, John, what are we teaching here? And John Stone says, happiness. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> oh, that is, that is brilliant. So there's often those times where, you know, we want to just, you know, alleviate the pressures of the day for, for caregivers as well and just entertain them, you know, mm -hmm. which is, I think that's part and parcel of my job is to make sure the music is, is working, especially for the, the guest celebrities that are there and making sure they have fun. Like Dave Grohl. I mean, come on, that guy is just, he, he lives and breathes Dave Grohl, of course, but he lives and breathes humor and energy. And I think he was the perfect like Muppet-esque person to have on Sesame Street. Um, and I, have you seen the Dave Grohl versus Animal Drum Battle from? I've seen that. Yeah. Oh yes. From the Muppet Show. From, oh yeah, yes. Yeah. I was fortunate enough. My good friend Brad Elliott, who uh, we worked with on Muppets Tonight, he's he was the prop master, and uh, one of the builders for that show, and he called me and he's like, "Hey, do you think you could fly out for a couple days and do this?" Because he was working on the Muppet. Uh, what was the? Uh, I'm blanking on the name of the show now. It was the the Miss Piggy Talk Show. What was the name of that Muppet show version for Disney? Um, I think it was just the Muppets. The Muppets, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Where it was the Miss yeah. Piggy talk show and then the behind the scenes stuff and the confession. Yes. And all that. Yeah. 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 So, and, and Dave Grohl was on that. And, and uh, Brad called me. He's like, well, can you come out and be animals drum tech for a day? And I'm like, say no more. Yes, I'm there. <laughs> and I go, what do you mean drum tech? And he goes, well, he's going to destroy the drum kit. You have to set it up exactly as it was so they can film it again. I'm like, done. I'm there. And he goes, um, <laughs> and he goes, what about if you could be Dave Grohl's drum tech on the day? I'm like, what? <laughs> like, he's, he may destroy his drum set and you might have to reset his drum set. I'm like, okay. So I literally, it was one day of work and my friend Brad Elliott got me that that gig, and of course that was when I first met Dave Grohl, and we just had a great chat. Um, but it was such it, he was actually Dave Grohl was still nursing his broken foot from a Foo Fighters show. This was like 2015 or 2016. He was on tour in the summer and fell off a stage in like Sweden and broke his foot. And for the re he, rest of the tour, he was in a cast and would sit in this giant throne that they made with guitar necks on it and stuff, and uh, play the show from there. But he was still had a, a brace on his ankle and he was kicking his own kit down as he and animal were destroying their kits. You got to look that up. Look that up on YouTube. It's, it's amazing. Oh, huh. I don't know. Can you hear the jackhammering? Not, no, no. Okay, good. No, no. If you hear, if Amazon arrives, you'll hear a uh, new heart barking, but he's pretty quiet right now. So, um, <laughs> okay. Anyway. Huh. Where are we? <laughs> Am I talking too much? No, 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 you're fine. You're no, fine. No, you're, you're loving, you know, doing, you love having, you know, not long interviews. So, cool. so, so we're, yeah. I did, I did one interview, it was just audio only, it was not for Zoom, it was for a, uh, my alumni uh, newsletter, and I talked to this woman for two hours and 10 minutes. So, uh. <laughs> thankfully, she edited everything down to a concise article. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so so you've won numerous awards for your main contributions to your know, sesame over the years you, you know how does it feel that the legacy of such an you know, iconic show still lives on still to this day yeah i mean it's yeah that's amazing too i think you know collectively when the show gets an emmy we all get an emmy you know what i mean um yeah the, the ones that i've specifically gotten are for music music editing um, and I've been nominated for music direction. So the, the two hats that I wear and, and composing as well. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a thrill. I mean, part of the, the cool part about that is it's, it's peer voted. So your, your peers are voting on those things. So they're, they're voting for, you know, there are audio engineers that are voting for music editing and uh, other musicians. So I, I really do appreciate that. But, um, you know, as I always say, when I was a, when I was a band director, there was a lot of focus and emphasis on, on trophies and I would try and tell the, my students, you know, we're, we're building a show here. We're building a musical show. It's what you get out of it as the musician within that show, not necessarily the, the, the awards that are on the wall. Um, but it, it's an honor just the same, honestly, it's a thrill. And, and the audio team is so good. I mean, part of the music editing and audio editing, uh, 
uh, award includes Dick Maitland. And Dick Maitland has been the sound effects uh, audio person since season one. You know, and, and yeah, has, that's I don't know, crazy. Has 38 Emmys yeah. or something. You know, the guy is just, he's a, a wizard. And Chris Sizzano's on that team as well. Our, our mixers are on that team. So, yeah, the music editing and audio editing part of it is, it's a lot of the, hardest work I do, I would say, in terms of the hourly work of me editing and tweaking, you know, tweaking vocals and things. Um, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's tedious because it's all in a day's work. Um, we never, you know, we, since we just finished season 54, it's, what do they say? The, the, the days are long, the weeks are short, you know, because the weeks just fly by. Um, and you're only, you're only it's, it's only work when you're in that like 12th hour of the day and you're tired. You know, it's it's never work because you're on set watching Muppet performers and cast and amazing celebrity guests. And I wish I could tell you who was on this year, but stay tuned. We had some great musical guests this year. Awesome. It's, Looking forward. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Definitely. Good stuff. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Continuing your work with puppets, you've also served as the vocal music director on the Netflix series Julie's Green Room. Yes. What was it like getting to work with Julie Edges herself? Yeah, that gosh. that was amazing. Um, not only her, uh -huh. but the guests that were on that show. Uh, I mean, Adina Menzel was on that show and um, mm. Carol Burnett. Uh, Leslie's biggest mentor on the planet is Carol Burnett. And Leslie got to work on Julie's Green Room that day and her head was exploding. Uh -huh. But one of the funnest moments for me, which I still uh -huh. have outtakes of on a hard drive, is Carol Burnett beatboxing. Huh. which is one of the greatest <laughs> things ever <laughs> because um, oh, you'll have to help me or rem remind me of the cast members names on this. Uh, but Julian, the, the human man on that show, who was uh, Julie Andrews cohort. He actually came into the vocal booth when Carol Burnett was beatboxing to give her a little beatboxing lesson, which was, that was a moment in time. I'm like, again, where am I? I'm watching a kid who's like 23 years old teaching boots cats boots cats to carol burnett and i'm recording this and what um but julie andrews i mean legend like you can't, can't say enough i mean i grew up listening to i think my mom had a couple julie julie andrews records i mean I, I knew the sound of music from um you know the movie itself um just, uh, I mean, a remarkable legend. And she knew exactly, she was so focused on that show and knew exactly what that show meant to her. Uh, and I think, and her daughter too, as far as like creating that show um, and bringing music to kids as it, you know, as the, those scripts panned out. Um, mm. Yeah, there's some more memoir, were, <laughs> memoir worthy <laughs> moments on that one, Adina Menzel in particular. I mean, her hitting these high, uh, what was she hitting high Ds? Um, you know, that belt that she has from Wicked that everybody knows. Mm, yes. Uh, he, she belted oh, yes. that day. And if you watch that episode, there's a moment where she hits this note, I don't know, three quarters of the way through the song. And of course, as she's recording it and I'm doing my thing, I'm cueing her with my left hand, I'm recording her with my right hand. And I'm just kind of just kicking back going, it's, it's like when Muppet performers get distracted and they're just watching TV. They say, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, I was just watching TV. <laughs> I was just <laughs> sitting there listening to her, like barely looking at Pro Tools. I'm just going, I'm listening to Adina Menzel. And like every take was fantastic. <laughs> I mean, if it were me, I'd be like, can we, can we use all those? Um, but she was <laughs> super, you know, performer specific and a pro and she wanted it just perfect. And I think, I'm not sure how many takes we did of that one particular belted phrase. Uh, but I mean, that was just, you know, watching a mus any musician kind of work through their own style um, is amazing because they're super specific about it um, mm. yeah. on that show. And also on Sesame, when we get when we get vocals from a musician, a celebrity musician, it can vary from a single mono vocal with no effects on it to multi tracks and harmonies and delay and reverb and all this stuff that they've done on their own which is again important because we want their vocal to sound like them uh like gwen stefani she i think she sent us oh, three, yeah. three stereo pair tracks for her vocal one lead mm -hmm. one background and additional harmonies yeah um and super amazingly produced you know just oh, wow. the, the effects were all on there the way she likes her reverb 
um, the way she did her doubles and her harmonies. Um, Nick Jonas, same way. He, yeah. wow. he, I guess, supposedly produces and records himself. Like when he's in the booth, he's pretty much wow. doing, okay, this is track one. This is track two. I'm going to double myself. Um, so his vocals were just like that too. Very specific. I think he gave us like two, two stereo pairs with effects all built in. Um, and then somebody like, well, like Jason Mraz on the day, he just sang that single vocal. Like he just wanted that to be clear, like he's singing it live oh because he wanted that delivery to be like he's on set, which that's yeah. what the music video shows. He starts in the laundromat, he wanders by the tree, the birds sing, he wanders to the one, two, three steps. Um, so for any vocalist, it's really fascinating for me to hear that stuff from a production standpoint and to think, how do they want their vocals to sound? Um, and Julie's Green yeah, Room sure. was pretty simplified that way because the 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 guest singers were always just there on the day. Most of those, most of the recordings we did, say at least half of them were recorded with me on set so that I would deliver those to the set. Now we add reverb and production value to the, the vocal tracks later. Um, so once that, once that vocal gets to post-production, there's a lot more effects on it. Um, but for Julie's Rima, it was they were pretty straightforward, pretty simplified you know, vocals. And real quickly, I guess you could uh, demonstrate uh, uh, like one of your instruments or something. Yeah, yeah. I know you mentioned well, that sure. at the beginning. Yeah. yeah. And if you if you need to go, you need to go. But yeah, so uh, I mentioned. I'll, like, I'll stay here for the demonstration. Okay. Don't wait for my dad to well, get back. I'll I'll stay here for the demonstration though. Cool. Well, I I, I was very inspired by Blue Man Group. Um, as you can imagine, it's 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 theater, it's humor, it's percussion, it's everything, uh, and a little bit by Stomp as well. But when I started, I, I started collecting and building instruments. I don't know, some 30 some years ago. And one of the things I saw years ago in a studio was a what a composer called a whale drum. Mm. And it was a giant metal tank that had tongues cut into it. And this is basically a smaller version of that. So oh, wow. nice. one of my glam huh. tanks. So and this is really thin metal. It's not super, super resonant. Um, and I'll use I'll use a steel drum mallet on this. But you can see where the different areas are that I cut into that. So that's one of wow. many of these that I have. I probably have 20 of these. I've been recycling some because I'm trying to pare down a little bit. Huh. So anywhere from this size to an acetylene tank that's about four and a half feet tall with uh, three pitches oh cut gosh, into it. That's bro. my bass tank. It hits a, a low E, like a bass guitar string. Um, mm -hmm. And then in a similar like vein, this is a, I don't know if you if you know, a, like a wooden slit drum. Mm, you yeah. basically have yeah. slits cut yeah. in. Well, this is a, a metal version of that. Okay. So, and this mm. is all aluminum. And I actually bought just a piece of aluminum stock and I sent it to my dad and my dad's friend did the welding on this, which is oh, nice. really hard to do. Uh, for those of you at home, don't try this at home because aluminum <laughs> welding is a lot harder than steel welding. I can do steel welding. I can't do aluminum welding. Um, so it's the same principle. I just cut different pitches into those are different sizes. And there's a lot of overtones on this. So the pitches aren't super specific. But the fun part is, is you can play it with anything. And I love using what I call different activators, different mallets or brushes or vibraphone mallets. Now is when I need my effects. There we go. can't see that but you can hear it oh my right? gosh uh, <laughs> right something like that that is, and then, awesome. That is awesome. That's really and cool. then to just That's the amazing. simplest like this is a found object this is actually an artillery shell and oh. no i didn't hmm. drill all those holes in it it, it comes like this and so I just look for, I look for things that resonate. And this in particular, if I hit this with something wooden. Wow. It just rings, it rings for days. So <laughs> wow. all yeah. of these metals, I, I, and I, I think I consciously chose metals because I wanted to experiment uh. with welding and cutting 
Um, but it also, it removes me from the blue man group PVC world. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and then stuff like this. Anyone, anyone, anyone? Aluminum ice cube tray from the uh -huh. 70s. I just love the engineering of this because it's such a simple and amazing tool. And then where's my heat sink? Uh, a heat sink. So I did, a, I did an acoustic piece um, which uses two of these for five players. So each, each player has a pair of these. Um, it's, it's called Cinco de Treo. Um, so there's, I mean, there's different sounds you can get out of a heat sink if you grind the metal down and get different pitches out of it. Mm -hmm. And they all sound different. I have so many of these now, I can't tell you. There's this one. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, let's see what else? Here is, so uh, these are, these are little music box. Oh. So in, in okay. a very old instrument from the early 20th century, those would actually turn and hit those little metal tines and create the song on those. And so I found these at an antique shop. Uh, there's like a ragtime oh. song on here, Rigoletto's on here. But for me, it's oh. just this. There's that. Yes, and for the people nice. listening on audio, you definitely want to tune into the video version. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. for sure. You'll get, you'll get more <laughs> out of it, so. for sure. You'll get more um, out of it. Well, and then there's some stuff behind me. I mean, the through COVID, sorry, you're hearing some reverb on that. Um, yeah. I, oh, God. God. I basically became obsessed with effects pedals. Hmm. Um, and here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch my camera really quick so you can see this. Sure. I... No worries. Oh, oh wow. 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 Oh, Actually, my go, gosh. Let me go. Yeah, over. you're going to switch to the video version. Yeah. For this. So here you go. Okay. So all these oh, effects, wow. all these effects pedals are basically Whoa. this one man setup that I have here for my vibraphone. Yes. And during COVID, I just got more and more obsessed with effects pedals. And and just basically, I'm a, I'm a punk at heart, so I'm trying to destroy the sound of the vibraphone. Um, <laughs> so, here, let me do this. So, I'll kind of start with just a clean vibraphone sound, if there even is such a thing anymore. So, uh, the vibraphone, so you know, has metal bars. Uh, it's like a piano in that when you press the pedal down, you get a sustained note. But the difference with a piano and the vibes are this vibrating or rotating cap in there. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, let me do the overhead view. And you'll see, you'll see, you can see something spinning underneath those caps, oh. right? Or underneath oh, the yeah, bars. Yeah, yeah. So that's what creates the vibrato of a vibraphone. So what I'm, what, what it's doing for me as I press the pedal down. That's where you get that vibrato effect. And I can adjust the speed of that. And I can turn that completely off. That's the general sound. So that's the clean sound. And that's oh what you're hearing right now gosh. is this microphone. Let's see. Oh. <laughs> to the other view. You uh -huh. see the, the uh, overhead oh, microphone yeah. that I have, which is right here. You're also hearing a little bit from my, my lav mic. Yeah. So that's a completely clean sound. If I start to add my effects, um, just so you know too, there is a, there's a pickup on every single bar. So if you were to look underneath, you'd see a little tiny piezo pickup super glued to every single bar. So what that yeah. does is that allows me to run the vibes through a bunch of different effects super cleanly and not get any feedback from having mics open on it. So I'll basically turn off the overhead mic 
you're still hearing a little on my love. But then I start, I start to add effects to it. So what happens when these mics are activated is you start to lose that vibrato because that vibrato is moving air around. Those caps that are spinning are actually moving air. And that's what mm -hmm. creates that vibrato, which you'd hear in the room. But when I start adding effects, like a little delay, and this, this little pedal right here is basically imitating a Leslie speaker that rotates. Wow. Oh. <laughs> And there's a little reverse. Oh, <laughs> what? Wow. Uh, yeah. Crazy. So that's wow. <laughs> and that's only two effects pedals, and I have like 13 Whoa. now or 15 now. Oh, so that's God. this is where I've lived for the last pandemic. Uh, is just playing with this stuff. And I'm also I'm I'm doing songs. I'm working through songs that I've always wanted to do covers of with Glank with my percussion group. Nice. Um, yeah. Because it's it's I've always wanted to just try some bombastic. Even I have Everlong from uh, Foo Fighters, and then. Uh, I'm, you're probably familiar with Reggie Watts. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Familiar with his looping yeah. that he does. Well, I have the same looper that he has because he he is such an inspiration to do uh, crazy looping of songs. And then, if you're not familiar with, you should be an artist, an artist by the name of that one guy. It's that and the number one guy. Look him up because thanks, Matt. Cheers. Uh, that one guy is a single multi-instrumentalist who's just uh, just one of my big inspirations for like the looping kind of stuff as is reggie watt so when i started messing around with the, the effects pedals and getting different sounds i also needed a bass so there's a there's an effect pedal called a pog which throws the octave down low one one octave down so that's the sound that I've always oh wanted. It's like a low, low octave, little distortion. The drive is coming from the, the Leslie speaker. And that reverse delay is coming from a line six delay. And then to my left is my homemade electric slide guitar uh -huh. called, called the Tricor. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so this, this I made out of a $15 Gretsch pickup, a tone control, and a piece of pine. Um, and I have it, you probably can't see, it's too far away. But I have marked, it's, a sl it's basically a slide guitar, like a dobro. Uh, and I have the pitches kind of penciled in as to kind of where they are. And of course there's distortion on that, because how can you not have... <laughs> And my favorite activator of choice with that is, of course, a tiny rubber hand. Right? Uh -huh. Again, destroying the sound of the vibraphone what? and other stuff. Oh, awesome. So. <laughs> But then it gets, you know, it gets deeper than that because I start adding effects here. This is one of the newer pedals I got. I'll put this over here. Well, you can kind of see it. There's, there's joysticks on this and it has tremolo and fuzz. So if I activate those, let's see. So that adds another level of, of vibrato basically that the vibes you know, are losing because of those pickups. <laughs> awesome. And then if I, if I had, a, if I had I... a stool and I could sit, I would do my kick drum from my roll and trigger and my, my snare trigger. Oh. 
It's too hard to do that live, so that's why I have the looper. So uh -huh. here, I'll do... Uh, are you blown away yet? Is your head exploding? Yes. Yet? <laughs> yes. Okay. So with V, yeah. And I, oh when I was setting gosh. this, when I was setting this up today for you guys, I was like, I had to remember the routing for everything. Cause yeah. I was just like, wait a minute, where does that pedal go again? So if you can see this, this looks like an old yeah. telephone. And I just got this from a guy, this nutty guy in, I think he's in Norway. Let me put the overhead on. Oh, wow. Um, so it looks like an old telephone, rotary dial telephone. And it basically, the red button just breaks up the signal. So if I hit a sustained note. Uh, turn my delay down. And if you dial it. That's what it does. Wow. And I'm just getting to know that pedal. <laughs> so that's another one. So uh, wow. let me get back to some. So then if I add my loops, if I did something simple like this. So this is me playing, playing percussion into the looper, right? Let me put the camera back here. Uh -huh. Hey, look, new hearts here. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong camera. Not that yeah. one. Aww. There it is. Hi, Newhart. Oh, New Heart. Oh, New Heart. oh, and there's Amazon. Hang on one second, guys. I gotta grab Amazon. There it works. I know, New Heart. Which you're gonna cut this part out. Yeah. You're gonna cut this part out. Okay. You're gonna cut this part out. <laughs> what that is what that's a that's crazy i know i feel i'm so i feel like i'm, I'm like not blow away no no like we we need to be on uh jason page like that is I know, crazy I was, yeah i was just thinking about that yeah but, but this <laughs> i know whole other level yeah I don't know. <laughs> and yes, at the end of this, I will be asking him if they're about like scheduling floods. And... Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I knew that would happen. That's okay. No worries. All right. Well, you heard this groove. So again, that's me playing percussion stuff live into the looper. And it's a four track looper, so you can add a bunch of different stuff. There's my demonstration. <laughs> that is awesome. That is amazing. The last couple of years. That's awesome. So, 
Thanks, thanks. Oh my gosh, I'm I'm, I'm speechless. I'm <laughs> that's what. So oh, and so and I've been meaning to do you know like Facebook Live. I did I did one Facebook Live uh, last summer uh, for on my birthday and. Wow. You know, Leslie's nice. like, you got to do more. You got to do like one a week. And so, you know, I've got, I don't know, 60 or 80 songs sort of ready to go. But it's one of those things where I want it to be perfect and I want all the effects right. to be right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, you know, rehearsing it and then it, being able to like come up with a set list is a whole nother thing. Yeah. Uh, so, nice. getting there. Nice. So, <laughs> oh my God. That's so, amazing. So no, thank, you, thank, you, thank you so much for, for, yeah. for showing that. Yeah, please. That was, you know, I wanted to make sure all this worked too, because I, I have another Zoom coming up. Actually, um, your DJ Bob friend, he and I are going to do a, an interview coming up in a couple of weeks. So, oh, yeah. Nice. He's wonderful. Oh, I'm, also, awesome. I'm actually doing a guest uh, appearance for uh, a good a friend of mine who's a composer who's doing a, a semester at Dartmouth, uh, a songwriting class. And she asked me to do a... Uh, uh, you know, basically showing my instruments and talking about Glenn. So they're basically going to do all of that again, basically. I'm basically right? doing that. Yeah. So this is a good test. <laughs> wow. <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah. To, so, re to hook everything back up and make sure it's still working. That was my goal. Yeah. So, yeah. That is, yeah. That, yeah. that is amazing. So, so, so now over to uh, animation and speaking of celebrities, you know, you work on uh, nature, the show Nature Cat, which uh, for those watching or listening that don't know, Nature Cat stars a lot of cast members from Saturday Night Live. So so what's it like getting to work with them? Another uh, it was another treat because, again, they're they're consummate pros at, at this stuff. I mean, yes, they've done live TV for a long time, but in terms of like, um, you know, character voices, listening to them work through a song is is another treat. I mean, Taron Killam, the 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 lead voice, Nature Cat, is kind of him. It's just him, very excited. So his his range is a little higher than he would normally like sing as himself. Mm -hmm. um, Kate McKinnon, her little the little mouse character, is way up there. So very <laughs> different than like a low alto character that she would have done on, on SNL. And then, uh, and Kate Micucci, uh, similar. She's kind of in the, in an alto range. Anyway, that, yeah. Um, it's, it's slightly different in animation because I, I'm, yeah. I, I'm always thinking about puppeteering and lip flaps and, right. and movement and things. And I have to, I have to kind of forget that as I'm working with them. Um, and, and David Rudman, of course, hired me for that. Yeah. Uh, who, uh, that's he and his, um, he and his brother, that's their, that's their show. Um, so it was great, yeah, working with those, that level of celeb because uh, mm -hmm. yeah, Fred Armiston came in and did did one song, and I was just like, ah, I'm working with Fred Armiston today, um, <laughs> Keenan as well. So yeah, it's um, you know it, what's great about the way David and his brother Adam run that show is it's it's just this well-oiled machine. They've been doing different forms of animation for. I don't know, 20 years. I don't know. They did a Jack's big music show. Years oh yeah. Ago. Oh, yeah. A great show. Yeah. yeah. I think that was, oh, yeah. I don't and, know uh, if that was Bunny Town. First. Yeah. Bunny yeah. Town. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some great stuff. No, and, and I'm thinking and, recently it's Don Quixote. Yeah. Yeah. They're working on Don Quixote now. Yeah. Uh, which of course is, is puppets versus animation. Yeah. But as far yeah, as they're, yeah, great they're show as well. they have such an affinity for classic comedy, like, um, uh, I mean, almost like Laurel and Hardy and, and like physical comedians and, and such. Um, and of course, for, for the classic, you know, cartoon stuff, you know, Looney Tunes thing. So they have that, they have that great background just coming into it as fans. And um, I, there's a lot of stuff, I think, in Nature Cat that they specifically, well, it's, it's a different show to watch than like a Nickelodeon show, I think, because of the editing. As you're watching a Nature Cat show, it's I, I think it's more Looney Tunes like and classic like because they spend time on on each frame or each phrase, versus mm -hmm. very jump cutty and super action. The way um, I can't really give an example of a of a Nickelodeon show, but just like different energy and editing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the the model now for like a, a half hour show is to put two 11 minute stories in there. So they've got they've got time to play in there rather than like a, a quick five minute animated story or three minute it's I think they're 11 minutes that's kind of the at least the, the PBS model and maybe other streaming models is doing two shows in a half hour. Um, yeah, and as as far as like for me it's a great gig because I don't have to engineer anything <laughs> I don't right. have to be I don't have to be the audio guy I can walk in with a piece of paper and work with the singer. 
uh, and just work through the song, you know. Awesome. And, and I and I walk out the door and I'm done. I don't have to do any digital editing or anything. It's great. Right. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. Nothing. I don't mind that. That's my bread right. and butter. But but yeah, it's a real fun. It's a very analog gig for me. So it's great. Awesome. Oh yes. So I'm kind of wondering. So what was it? What was it like working on the Apple TV Plus series Helpsters? That was fun. Uh, it was it was different. That's again that 11 minute 11 minute model. Like we do, we would do two episodes within that like half hour. So, mm -hmm. um, in terms of the, like the number of shows over two full seasons, if you counted each 11 minute show, I think it was 52. Is that right? Was it 26 mm. times two, something like that? Um, well, that was great because it, it it essentially started from Sesame Workshop as a production so we had a lot of the same team you know working on that uh in fact my audio guru chris Susanna was on that which was great because we did we, there was a lot of music on helps there's a lot of repetition of the song like the theme songs and the the repetitive songs that that every celebrity would then come in and sing on uh and frank damalo our amazing engineer too we had we had a blast on that show because we were we were all in the same room and somehow, you know, first season, we got through first season, but second season, we got through COVID, you know, with testing and everything during uh, the second season. So, yeah, and a lot of location shoots, a lot of outdoor work, um, very different than, than Sesame. We've done a couple Sesame things outdoors, but, you know, having a PA, having speakers outside, doing lip syncing outside. Um, but yeah, it was great. Um, and, and the directors were great because they were most of the directors i think were were muppet or puppet oriented directors which is great because they anybody that has that experience comes to the show with that with that eye and and how they see the puppets in relation to the human as far as the scale goes and the height and all that um and there's some just some great comedy in that show i mean sam McEwen, yeah who, who uh, comes from a comedic standpoint as the uh, creator and showrunner is just funny i mean just a funny person so you're you know each show has its little tasks that each character kind of helps solve they're basically solving a problem you know for each show or for each episode um but it's it's fun to watch those three different personality characters and i, and I think shout out to marty robinson because yes I, uh, he's also a previous guest yeah mr he's, prim he's awesome that mr prim is just one of the funnest and kind of weirdest characters I've, I think I've, I've ever seen. He's kind of ageless, <laughs> you know, and he's got that kind of British accent. It's very proper. And he's, and, and watching he and Jim Krupa operate that puppet because Jim Krupa was often oh, assisting yeah. Marty with uh -huh. his, his little hands, his little white gloved hands. <laughs> it was just, you know, from, and I'm, I'm not a puppeteer, but I, I, of course I appreciate the, the craft and the skill of it. Watching mm -hmm. those two every day was just like a masterclass in, in just subtle things. And the other thing about Mr. Prim's character is his eyes. They're these little, you know, ping pong ball eyes, which in a lesser experienced puppeteer, it's really hard to get that eye focus and, and make you yeah. believe he's looking off up there or he or he's looking up at the guest or he's looking down. It's a, Marty is a master at that and, and could move those eyelids too. And and his mustache, you know, the mechs, the mechanisms they made for those puppets was just great because he had a, he had oh, a trigger wow. just for his mustache, which becomes yeah. part, of, part of his personality. Um, mm -hmm. I love watching that too, because I'm such a, I'm such a nerd for the building of puppets. Now that I've seen this for 25 years and Jim Krupa is a, a master builder too. Oh yeah. Um, looking at the way I mechanisms, mechanisms work. Um, he actually uh, helped Leslie with her character velvet Lamour, which is a full size head lamb character that he worked on the eyes for her for that having an yeah. eye mech in there um and i was just talking to somebody the other day about um uh, about johnny and the sprites and yes yeah, a great show. show amazing Such a show great that, show that, that, I leslie, mean, that leslie is also part of that yeah, yeah. So ginger sprite ginger mm -hmm. sprite in that and yes. Tim gas <laughs> and uh heather ash I, 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 i'm um, carmen osbar which is carmen, also a previous yeah. guest yeah, <laughs> yeah. So She's, I mean that show talk about great music too. Johnny John Tartaglia, you know, was yeah. able to go to his Broadway friends and, and Stephen Schwartz and, and all these people that yeah. wrote amazing music for it. But mm -hmm. I visited set a couple of times, and the one wow. day I visited set, Krupa was working on these ants that make it look like they're climbing little bamboo reeds. Yeah. And he did it in such yeah. a simple way. It's just this almost like this eye trick where you're looking at it, going, "Oh yeah, they look like they're climbing," but you can kind of walk with them. And so he and I 
Well, you can't. Uh, there's a. There, I have a GI Joe that I've always wanted to be able to play percussively, like really play, like not mm -hmm. just puppeteer and and have the hands going like this, but but really be able to actually play complex stuff with it. And I had sort of done things where I, you know, I basically broke the the connection of the elbow and put a rubber band there and done all this stuff. But I really someday, this is my bucket list, is to work with Jim on a puppet or G.I. Joe sized mech that can really play where the puppeteer is shrouded in black and behind mm -hmm. it. Um, if you look up a Glank video called, uh, it's called Girl Car Sports. It's an old, it's a, this, I, I ripped a sample from an old 1950s education film. But I basically used me playing a G.I. Joe. I'm in a Glank suit, the anonymous Glank suit, which is, that's my thing there. <laughs> we, wear, we wear clean room suits, so we're all anonymous. So I'm basically standing behind the G.I. Joe and I'm, I'm manipulating his, the G.I. Joe arms to play an instrument because I love messing with scale. Um, but that's, a, that's yeah, watching, watching him work on a mechanism is really, really fun. And, oh, yeah. and Jim Kerb Johnny and the Sprites had oh, yes. a bunch of those. You know, I think I think Ginger. Well, Ginger had wings. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I don't think she had an eye yeah. neck. Uh -huh. Yeah, and and that's the thing too with no, that build. I and I think so. I think Johnny worked with Jim or the builders or Henson or whatever to make sure that each each character kind of had their own mechanism or their own style that they could really work into the character, mm -hmm. which is really cool. It's a great way yeah. to look at puppeteering, you know, as a as the legacy of Jim Henson. You know. Oh yeah. Definitely. Oh yes, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and you know, speaking of you know, helpers, which is all we also helpers, previously yeah. Stephanie DeBruzzo, which yeah. is yes. Stephanie is Stephanie such, great. yeah, she she's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. she's amazing. She's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, so overall, working as a music director, what are some of the key things you say you've taken or learned the most? Wow, as a music director, um, <laughs> well, I mean, I think I think part of it when I'm working through the song with anybody, whether it's our cast or a celebrity, um, is just making people comfortable in a studio. I mean, that sounds so simple, but it can be very complex because if you're working, especially working with kids, like if we bring kids on Sesame Street um, to be part of a song, a lot of the kids have never had headphones and been on a microphone before. So whether they're eight or 10 years old or, or 45 years old, I need to make them comfortable in the booth and working through the songs and listening to themselves on headphones and such. I think that's probably the biggest thing I learned over 25 years, even working with just musicians, even with working with a guitar player or uh, a character vocalist. Um, some of the celebrities we've had on Sesame have been in my office, like Alan Cumming. I mean, this is a Broadway legend. Michael McKeon, where they were both in my little booth. Uh, Audra McDonald, you know, standing there singing. So I don't know what I can really bring to them <laughs> from my standpoint, because they're singing as themselves. Although Alan Cumming and uh, Michael McKeon were both kind of definitely characters. Alan Cumming was a, a grouch, basically. It was a very Oscar-centric script. So he got to be a very yeah. grouchy, which was hilarious. Um, and Michael McKeon, instead of doing like his spinal tap British rocker, he actually chose, he's like, I want to do like kind of a Southern rocker. Cause he wanted to kind of, he'd done the spinal tap thing many, many times and, and hilariously. Um, but he wanted to do it to have a different take on it. So as, yeah, as, it, as a music director for that kind of thing, brand new person in the booth with a brand new character, it, it, helps them if I, if I know the script really well too, from top to bottom, and I kind of know the arc of their character, um, if they have, have read the script or they have not read the script, I can at least show them the nuts and bolts of the script to say, well, here's what your character is doing on this song. And then four pages later, there's a different emotion to this part of the song. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's part and parcel with Sesame Street for sure. Um, the emotion of it is deeper than like say other shows. Um, Helpsters, it was often just a fun musical interlude that we were doing, or one of those repetitive songs that, that kind of everybody does um, within the show. It really helps kids learn learn by repetition. Um, I think that's one thing, and that's I know that sounds kind of nuts and bolts like of just working in a studio, but it really does mean a lot when somebody is is newish to the studio scene or at least you know recording themselves headphones mics and all that um 
Yeah, and I guess, uh, I guess on set with celebrities, I'm always, I'm already confident with them, if that makes sense. Like if they're mm -hmm. lip syncing to a song, they might have recorded it days before, so it might not be really familiar to them because they just literally recorded it. But I figure, you know what? This person has been on camera a million times for hundreds of hours doing music videos. They don't, meet, they don't need me to tell them <laughs> much because they're already doing it. They're, they're themselves. If they miss a lip sync, they probably know it. What I'm looking for there is like really specific things like, okay, the Muppets and the guest are holding a note, four counts, and they cut off on beat five. And I want everybody to cut off on that count. And so that's very rhythmically specific and I'll do my best to cut them off. If I see a little, they're going too long or too short, I'll just kind of re subtly remind them of that um, without, you know, in, in a very diplomatic and, and, and professional way. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I'm trying to think of what else. That's a great question, though. I've never really thought about what I've gleaned from, you know, working on Sesame or Helpsters or all these mm. shows. Um, I mean, I mean, Sesame part of it is just the legacy. I always, I always, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, what would Joe Raposo do? You know, right. or especially when I'm writing, if I'm composing, um, and I have an idea about. Well, obviously, I know the lyrics and the message and the curriculum and all that, but I'll often look backwards and look at the early 70s, like something like Simon the Sound Man and think, well, OK, what did they do on that little rhythm there? Or why did Joe Raposo choose that style you know, for mm -hmm. this song? Um, that's more composing, I guess, than music directing, but kind of all in the same. So. <laughs> Nice, definitely. So let's talk a little bit of because you mentioned it a couple times before. Let's talk a little bit about uh, about about Glank. How, how was uh, that formed? That formed uh, when I was living in L.A. Um, and I basically I, like I said, I've had an affinity for found object instruments for a long time. Um, when I was in undergrad school, I found there's a book called Sound Designs and it's instrument building uh, from anything from, you know, a solid two by four plank to uh, glass water bottles, the big old glass water bottles, metal, wood, glass, all these different kind of things that you could make into instruments. And so the, one of the first things I did was build a set of tune saw blades. Um, that was one of my earliest uh, creations for the Glank world. Sorry, let me get this. I'm hearing that noise. You're probably hearing it too. This is hitting okay. against that cable. No worries. You know, I'm an audio guy. I should have that cleared up. Um, so it started with me building instruments. And then um, because I, I part of the reason I love anonym, anonymous players, anonymity, it really goes back to marching band and drumline. Because in, the, in, a, in a marching band, you're all essentially performing in the, at, the, at the same style. Uh, snare drummers are playing at the same height. Tender drummers, you know, they're all basically executing in this specific way that is supposed to match and you're all wearing the same uniform. Um, and I just, I love that vibe. I love seeing 200 musicians on a field, you know, on a football field or an indoor competition or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, doing that. And so the clean room suit kind of part of Glank, which is the anonymous performer thing came out of that. It kind of came out of marching band. Um, and I just love the stoic aspect of it too. Um, when I was in marching band and drum corps, we were not all hype and like, you know, smiling and grooving. We were all just really serious, stoic. Everybody basically looked the same. And so with Glank, I was like, I can take that to another level. I can put these masks on that hide our faces completely. Mm -hmm. And so nobody really knows the emotion unless, unless they're really listening to it. And that's the goal is like, you're just listening to this groove. And if we, if we not bob our heads a little bit, okay. But it's basically, you're just listening to this. And the sound of it, I always wanted to feel like a 1950s sci-fi soundtrack, like kind of distorted, kind of um, not not using sounds from the 50s, but um, I just like that look, that aesthetic. Um, Atomic Lounge, I think, is is either my wife came up with that or somebody else might have come up with that. But that's kind of the 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 gist of like the sound of the music. I don't want it to sound like techno or EDM, although we do some EDM songs. Um, I wanted to have this look. And so what Glank started yeah. as was kind of a party group. I would just bring my friends and I would throw up a track of pre-existing 
like probably just EDM stuff, simple stuff. And we would all play on my Glank instruments or flat bass drums. And we would just kind of groove along to that. And so we would play at art galleries. Um, we played at this place in, in uh, Southern Cal called Moto Art, where they make furniture out of, out of airplane parts. Mm. So we were the perfect like party band for that because we all we had these crazy weird instruments. And we played, we played their holiday party, I think three years in a row. Um, and then it became, when I moved it to New York, I brought a bunch of instruments here and I, I really wanted to ramp up the theatrical part of it. So I created a show where the audience becomes anonymous. So during the show, the audience has under every seat, there's a little kit that has a mask and a lab coat and a shaker with a little LED light in it. And so mm. they become part of the show. And that's, it's not for me, audience participation for me, uh, I'm not a big fan of like the scary clown, the, somebody coming up, hey, grab this shaker, start playing this. I'm, I'm that shy person in the front row. But if everybody is collectively doing that, rather than singling someone out, I want the entire audience to feel that vibe and also kind of blur the line mm -hmm. between performer and audience member. Like that's key. But yeah. if, if they can get that feel of like being anonymous, being industrial, I, my tagline for Glank is industrial percussive alchemy. Um, if they can kind of get that feel, like that's the goal. And so if you look up a couple of my videos, you'll see the audience at La Mama in, wow, it's been 12 years, 2011. Um, that was a full sit down theater show, 99 seat theater, where by the end of the show, everybody, everyone, audience and performer has a mask on, has a, has a white lab coat, uh, has a shaker with an LED and the lights all go down and everybody's doing this performance with a shaker. And I also throw in things like a shaker lesson and I make it very kind of 1950s sounding where we give the step-by-step -step instruction of how to perform a shaker. And I had some great talented voiceover people do very staid kind of stoic descriptions of that with voiceover uh, to give some to lend some humor to it uh, and then aside from the theatrical show we also do just outdoor performance shows we, we performed at the maker fair for five or six years in a row just outside and i'd throw up a track we play we might do an acoustic piece but for that it was a lot of kids coming up to our tables and playing instruments with us and so looking at oh. a propane tank that's tuned and going wow i've never heard this before and we would just do jams with that. And that would go on from noon until six or seven o'clock in the afternoon. It was great. Like just jam wow. sessions. And I would hire some percussionists to come out for a couple hours and we'd kind of overlap. And, um, and also uh, the one instrument I'd love adding to it is the bass guitar because I always wanted some good low end. So mm. my good friend Brad Kemp would always come in and play bass for those shows. Um, and then for the theater, the theatrical shows, I also do a lot of video projection. I love doing multimedia stuff. Um, that piece, Girl Car Sports, is a projected piece where we're playing along with it. And then there's another one called uh, Aluminum on the March, which um, that's a public domain video that I edited up. And it's a bunch of stop motion aluminum things, like these aluminum stilt walkers. And uh, that's one of my favorite pieces, because partly because it's public domain, and I was able to use the music from it as an intro to what we play which is a bunch of loops and, you know, some cool uh, vibraphone stuff in that. So yeah, that's kind of Glank in a nutshell. It's been, it's been on pause for a while, of course, with the pandemic. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm also having to rethink how the audience interacts because something like a mask that's this close to your face, you're not going to want to use someone else's mask from a previous show now with COVID. <laughs> so I have to be able to design and, afford <laughs> to have each audience member have a brand new mask and a brand new lab coat under their seats to mm. do the show right or at least have you know the first few rows maybe would have those and they pay an extra ticket price or something right uh, yeah but there's a the one place i really want to perform is uh that place in manhattan called the little island it's um, on the okay. hudson river it just opened recently i think maybe even just last summer they have a couple of venues oh. there. really cool outdoor stage that faces the river um, and then a smaller stage as well. It's like, it's an old, <laughs> like, um, where the old uh, docks and things were, all the old like pylons, they built this whole park that is basically kind of suspended above the river. It's really cool. Little island. Nice. 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 <laughs> but no, I have, I have no Glank gigs on the horizon, partly because I'm going through all my gear and going, ah, 
I need to throw this away. I need to recycle that propane tank. <laughs> it's uh, and kind of downsize a little bit because I've the players. It's either five players. It has to be like five, like just for the look and the anonymous look. Um, I've had as many as fifteen at one performance. Uh, we did a couple in LA where I had fourteen or fifteen players, which is just amazing to hear oh, that nice. sound. And that's that's that percussion ensemble sound that I was talking about from my earliest days. That's that's the sound I've been chasing. You know. I think all my musical life that production <laughs> sound. Awesome. Oh yes, that's that's awesome. So so we've talked a lot about your work in the past, but can you share any projects you're currently working on? Well, it's uh it's Sesame for now. Uh, we just wrapped season fifty four. Mm -hmm. um, Helpsters, we wrapped season two, which was what a year ago. Um, I don't see a Julie's Green Room coming back, sadly, anytime soon. Um, uh, Nature Cat, there might be some more on the horizon there, but I'm not sure. I think they've done three full seasons and they might be done. I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I'm happy, you know, with, with Sesame and the work we have. Um, you know, it's off and on throughout the year. It's, you know, we've got some digital projects coming up for YouTube. Um, let's see, I can't share a lot of that Please. stuff with you. Um, I got I to gotta be super secret about those yeah you know, kinds of things um <laughs> but live live performances too you know we when we we did the jazz at lincoln center yes oh, yeah. for, uh, it was for 29 that was part of the 50th I uh -huh. mean, that was just that's definitely the pinnacle for me of working with musicians of that caliber of winton marcellus and his group those those performers are just incredible they're all amazing arrangers in their own right um, you know, we did we did 13 mm -hmm. songs, classic Sesame Street songs, but all mm -hmm. brand new arrangements. Yeah. And Winton arranged two of those and the, and the rest of the band arranged all these new versions of the song. So hearing that for the first time, I mean, we're, we're all hearing these arrangements for the first time. And, and Leslie singing as a cow, you know, for, uh, you know, the pinball numbers song was just <laughs> <laughs> amazing. So, I, I mean, I, I hope there's more live stuff. Yeah, um, that'd be awesome. You know, yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of rare. Um, you know, we we've done the Easter egg roll at the White yeah, House a few times. Uh -huh. That's always fun. It's very short. You know, those are they they do that in a way. There's like five groups of audience that come in in and out throughout the day, so they get like thirty some thousand people in and out. So um, uh, and then we did the Capitol Fourth a couple times. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Hope there's some more live stuff yeah. coming up. Awesome. Awesome. We're looking forward to that. Definitely, cool. definitely, definitely. So now, what are some of the biggest uh, challenges or setbacks you faced working in music? Challenges or setbacks? Um, well, you know, I think I mentioned this before, but it's only work when you're in your 14th hour uh, <laughs> on any given day, and it's a really long day. Um, yeah. Honestly, like in, in terms of music, it's it's hardly anything. It's mostly the nuts and bolts of like coordinating things. And a lot of that has to do with the pandemic. Like when I did the mm. music for Sesame Place, um, the logistically, it was very different writing music for that band because they were all recording individually. Mm -hmm. And then I had to, I had to kind of pre-assemble all of their tracks and then send them to our audio mixer. Um, so the, I mean, you know, the pandemic was, crazy for everybody and everybody had logistical changes that they had to kind of morph through um so definitely that but that again like nuts and bolts how do we assemble these tracks how do we have them record it's it's so much better to be in a room with a full band and listening but on the, on the same by the same token all those musicians are so good in their own right performing that they can we can record the drums individually and all the horns individually. It's all going to come together and sound amazing. Um, you know, they all have that groove, you know, in them. It's not like they all have to be together, but when it's together, it's just, it's incredible. Um, mm. I think with, with Muppet performers, um, the biggest challenges can be what I was talking about earlier is that vocal range. You know, when we have, mm -hmm. if we have a celebrity that sets the key for any specific song, the challenge for me is to find maybe a new harmony for Abby to sing against that celebrity. And also one of the challenges too is letting that celebrity vocal really speak against all of our vocals. 
So in other words, I don't want, if, if the singer is singing a melody here, I don't want all of our performers singing that same melody. I yeah. like to try and harmonize around them or sing an octave below them because then it allows them, the celebrity to really speak um, mm -hmm. and sing through the song. And, and it's, you know, it's their song that a lot of that, of course, has to do with the mixing too. If we are singing the same melody, you know, we tuck, we tuck our vocals down a little bit and let that, you know, celebrity vocal come through. Um, that can be, that's just challenging for me because, because I'm recording our voices individually. If, if we had all the Muppet performers in one room and we were hearing our guest vocalist vocal and they were all singing to that, that would be very different than me just doing them one at a time. Mm -hmm. Because on that, yeah. in that case, I could literally change harmonies while we're working through that. We, we did that a little bit with the, um, with the performance at the Kennedy Center where they had to sing mm -hmm. live for that. I had to, I changed a few things for that, like on the day that we were rehearsing through things. Um, you know, the live, live singing can be challenging for the Muppet performers because almost, you know, physically it's very difficult. If they're literally with their chin in their chest and they're looking at a monitor and they're rolling around physically, it's really hard to do that and, and crank out a character voice. So some of those challenges can be just physically like, how can we help the Muppet performers, you know, be more comfortable and breathe and, and still perform and, and puppeteer at the same time, you know? Definitely. Definitely. Yes. Good so, question though. Thank you. That's good. Yeah, of course. That yeah, of course. <laughs> so, okay, this is kind of interesting. So what is that piece of advice would you give to anyone who wants to get into to the industry that you're, that you've been you know, working on your music and all that? Well, I, I've spoken to, you know, college students, high school students. And the one thing I, I tell all of them is to stay, stay on top of your specific craft, like the technology of it all. Um, I mean, that's kind of more or less plateaued. And that could be with video editing, audio editing. When I was learning mm -hmm. those, both of those formats, video and audio were changing drastically every year to the point where now everybody can get Adobe Premiere, Final Cut, you can edit videos yeah. in days, and they're very similarly aligned. Even their, even the user interface kind of looks similar. Um, Logic Audio that Apple and Mac make looks similar to Pro Tools. Um, but it's, aside from that, like learning that, learning those tools like backwards and forwards is super helpful. Um, because I think it, it, I do a lot of video editing just for Glank, but it also helps me when I'm watching a director on Sesame Street work through, if we're, if we're doing a music video and they have that maybe storyboarded in the script, I can at least look at that and go, oh, okay, well, the focus is not so much on this, it's on that for this phrase. And that can kind of inform me as to how I would cue people or at least, you know, the Muppet performers themselves. I'm like, okay, well, this, this phrase is definitely the guest singing that phrase. And while you're part of it, it's not necessarily the focus. So even just having a little video background um, is super helpful with that. So as a musician, I would tell another musician to maybe learn Final Cut <laughs> or learn Adobe Premiere and kind of, you know, understand how that audio or how that video editing works um, if they want to go down that road of doing any music videos. Um, so, you know, staying on top of technology is one thing. Um, I mean, as far as like working with people, like don't burn any bridges, <laughs> you know, because that, that 25 year old PA you're working for in 10 years could be one of the producers. I mean, that happens all the time, you know, in, yeah. in Hollywood and in, in the business. So, um, you know, if, if I, if I knew more on Muppets tonight, I, mm -hmm. I would have talked to more people. I think I was so focused on the music end and just talking to the music people that in hindsight, I should have talked, I would have loved to talk to Jerry Nelson more, you know, and get yeah. stories from Jerry Nelson or Dave Goals or, or Brian Henson, you know, but there's, there's hardly any time to do that because you're so focused on the day's work. And when you're into that 10th hour of work and you have a five minute break, that five minutes is not enough to go up to Jerry Nelson and say, so in the, <laughs> in the first Muppet <laughs> movie, when you were assisting, you know, like how, and, and there was no internet back then anyway. So I only knew what I saw on VHS tape or DVD or in the theater. <laughs> so, um, 
Mm -hmm. But Jerry, you know, in his own right, was a great musician and great singer. Uh, I helped him uh, produce his uh, Truro Daydreams, his, his CD. Oh, yeah. Um, in 2009, which was just a dream because I'm like, wow, he's doing, these are his songs. They have nothing to do with Sesame Street or the Muppets. They're just songs that he's written. In fact, he, he wrote some of those songs back in 95 when Leslie's dressing room was right next to his. He was working on some of the songs that made it to the CD. So I'm like, wow, that all comes full circle. Uh -huh. um, so, wow, yeah, my advice to someone who's working, I, I mean, get to know those kind of people, not just professionally, but socially too, and just get some stories, you know of people like that I, I wish i would have done that more definitely uh, so turning the yeah. tables what's the best piece of advice you'd say you've received um wow well it really it comes down to working with the first composer i worked with which was uh, richard gibbs and the way he would we would w work through a piece of film and this was actually on the tracy Ellman show um I, I kind of felt just from watching movies and TV that I kind of had somewhat of an instinct for how film composing works, you know, um, and, and films over hundred years have gone from like wall to wall music to no music to sound design as music, sound effects. So it's, it's, it's changed, you know, over decades. But what Richard would do with me is we'd watch a piece of film. We'd watch a three minute segment. And he would ask me, where do you think the music should start? It's like, he's like, I have to underscore this scene. It's gotta be subtle. Where should it start? Mm. So that was super helpful for me just because I, again, I thought I had an instinct and I would watch a piece of film and go, Ooh, right there where that guy, he kind of turns his head and it looks like he has an idea. Like that's where the music should start. So those kinds of things that were intuitive to Richard, cause he'd been doing film music for, decades well at least 10 15 years at that point that was super helpful for me to to watch that so it's like it'd be like watching a movie without any sound you know yeah. which is hard to do and just hear the dialogue and know where you know where that where that uh, song should start oh you know what i got an alarm going off it's 2 45. wow it's 2 45 and we I, I told you we'd talk for two hours <laughs> it happened um my alarm's going off Oh, it'll stop in a second. Anyway, um, yeah, that's one piece of advice. I mean, that's not really a piece of advice, but that was like, that was a mentor helping me. Um, so I don't know how that could works into the advice world aside from uh, a musician breaking down music to a point where they can figure out what they can add to it, I guess. Is that a good way of saying it? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. That's another really yeah. good question. No one's ever sure. asked me that question. What <laughs> advice have I gotten? Um, <laughs> I mean, in university, it's like practice, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. You know, get to know yeah. that instrument, one instrument, your mm -hmm. main instrument, just backwards and forwards, you know, and extend your techniques, which I love doing with all these crazy effects and everything is taking the instrument itself and just going beyond where it should go yeah. uh, or applying different things to it. Um, yeah. I guess. Does that work? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So are there any words which would you like to say to those who are watching or listening how to support your work over the years? Oh, how to support my work? Yeah, you know, like uh, are there any words you'd like to say to the people who have supported your work over there oh. like on Sesame Street and Oh wow. Well, well so uh, almost tonight or anything. Yeah, yeah, I mean a huge thank you for being fans for one thing, because it's even even finding like Muppets Tonight clips on YouTube. I'm like, Oh yeah, that's out there. Here you gotta watch yeah. this. And people that haven't seen it are like, oh, my God, you were, John Goodman can really sing, you know. Um, yeah, no, that's just it's a big thank you for that kind of stuff. I mean, yeah, 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 pleasure. Does that um, make sense? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if people would like to connect with you, where's the best place people can find you? Uh, my website, which is glank, glank, glank dot com. G-L-A-N-K. 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 Yeah. 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 There's that. And then there's just paulrudolphmusic.com as well. Nice. So and those are my two, uh, nice, nice my two entities. Nice websites will be in the description down below so people can yeah. check it out. I appreciate that. Thank you. Nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah of, course. Nice. of course. So so the last question that Jake's about to ask is the question that we ask to all of our guests at the end. Yes, we sure do. So, of course, you know, this podcast is called Jake's Hype Nostalgia Show. When you think of nostalgia, what do you think of or how would you define your own words? How would you define 
the word nostalgia. Nostalgia. Wow. Okay. Well, since we're on the subject and it's been on my brain, it's for me the nostalgic aspect of the Muppet Show, like the original Muppet Show. Mm -hmm. To me, yeah. that's that is nostalgia for me personally in a nutshell because of where I am right now. I mean, that might not be. Yes. I guess it's nostalgic for other people too, but um, for me, just looking at those old shows and knowing now what I know about not only the skill of puppeteering, but the way they worked through a song back in the day um, and the logistics of putting together a song on set. Like for me, that's, that's nostalgic because it was a oh, different yes, way of sure. doing things. They, they had things on tape back then. They had reel to reel tapes. They were playing on the side. The, the Muppet band was always there um, performing live on set, which we had, a, you know, a couple times on Muppets tonight. Um, but that's nostalgic. The live part of that show being created and, and made is super nostalgic to me. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. So, that's for sure. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, great, great words. To, and I I'm, appreciate I'm you guys so much as just as the super fans that, that know this stuff. And honestly, you've asked questions that, again, I'm still thinking about some of the questions you asked, which is good. Like that's, <laughs> that's super important <laughs> because it, it's, it, yes. it means you guys are thinking about stuff more than just fans. You're, you're thinking about it from internal you know, human aspects to this, all this stuff. Yes. So really, I appreciate yes. what you guys are thank doing. Thank you. And, and I'm glad, and thank you, you know, like Chris said, thank you so much for being on the show. It's, it's been a blast. And thank you for what you've done to be a part of our childhood, you know, and, keep, and yeah. you know, of course, you know, with Leslie, yes. of course. But yeah, and and, and cool. keep up your great work and see, and see what's next for you. Yes. yes, sounds great. Yes, keep in touch, Paul. Let you know when yes, this goes sure. up. Sounds great. appreciate it. All, all right. right. Bye, Paul. Thanks, Take care, Paul. Have a great rest of your day. Cheers. See you, Paul. Bye. Yeah. Yeah, see you, Paul. Well, and it's goodbye from us as well. Yes. 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 It, was, it was a blast talking to, to Paul Rudolph, the wife, husband of Leslie Craig Rudolph. And um very looking forward for for more interviews coming up, which you guys will be very excited for and cannot wait for what's what's next to come so yes and as, that, folks and as of taping we're not going to say who but as of taping tomorrow we also have a really another really fun interview which you guys yes, will definitely you love guys when that goes up. you're not going to miss this yes well anyway it's goodbye from all of us to all of you and always yes. as always remember to keep nostalgia alive bye -bye, yes, take care i want to see you next time bye bye take care thank bye. you for tuning in to another wonderful jake's happy nostalgia show interview be sure to follow Jake and the crew on social media and stream the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And as always, remember to keep nostalgia alive. Bye-bye.